everybody's got this document here that I drafted about stewardship for the culvert resistant canola. You don't have to read it now, but it's gonna, it covers in detail what I'm gonna talk about. So if you're like me, you have to hear something or read something several times before it finally sinks in. So, so I, I don't know how many of you have heard, but the, the culvert resistance in one field around Edmonton, we've confirmed that it's, it's no longer effective for the strain that has developed there. And it is something that um, we've been investigating cases over the last few years. A farmer would come and say, you know, I'm finding club root in my field with a club root resistant variety. And we've been able to, to deduce in the past that it's been volunteers, et cetera. And, you know, the club root resistance has been holding up. But in the case from 2013, it didn't look like it was volunteers. And then when the, the galls were taken back to the lab, and growing in a pot with the certified seed of that variety, the, the, it was completely susceptible. And we had, we had five or six fields, but re it really boiled down to the, there was one field that it, it was proven to, the, the strain had overcome the resistance. Get, then the obvious question was, is it not just this variety? So then we took the same galls and we planted them with certified seed of, of representative varieties from all the companies and they were all susceptible. So this particular strain then had overcome the resistance that looked like it was fairly generally the same resistance in all the commercial varieties. So we don't have now uh, a club root resistance in a canola that will work on that one strain in that field. Now, how many other fields have this? It's, it's, um, we're gonna probably do a, a more intensive survey looking for it. But it, is it something that, um, is unexpected. It was in our club root management plan that club root resistance around the world has been um, vulnerable to breakdown in other crops, not just canola, but the brassica vegetables. So we were, we were warning that this could happen. It didn't seem to be taking a lot of uh, traction with the growers because talking to growers, they were growing them more than once in every four years, which is what we were recommending. I know a few growers had for resistant crops on a club root infested field in five years. Is that stewardship? So, you know, looking, so looking at the history in this pamphlet, it, it shows you but as early as in the 1960s with cabbage, they, they you know, brought in some resistant cabbage from, from Europe, from Germany, and they planted it. And within a few years, they found that it was getting resistance breakdown. So this is 1960s, that was with cabbage. Interesting in, in that respect is that they also found that if they didn't grow that resistance for a, a number of years, I think it was three years, they found that that pathogen, that tight in this, kind of went down in frequency in the soil. And then when they reintroduced that resistant variety, it seemed to work again. So it's not that when resistance fails, it's gone for good, but until the pathogen population shifts to something else, you know, then it's not effective anymore. So we've had Chinese cabbage around the world, Australia and in, in Asia that has had that same problem with resistance. What about canola? Well, in Europe, they were the first ones to breed for club root resistance in their winter types. And the Mendel is the one variety that first came out in about nine, in 2001. And um, looking through the reports, the disease reports from Europe, I came across one in the UK where the, the, a grower had planted two winter canola crops back to back with Mendel. And in the second crop, he had resistance breakdown. So as, as quick as two crops, okay? And then now in and, and and this publication, you see a map of, of Germany and it shows you the years that they've been surveying. And then the, on the third line or second line, it shows you like 27 of 18 in the Northeast. So the, out of 27 fields they surveyed, 18 had, for Mendel, had resistance breakdown. So in other words, where Mendel's grown a lot in Germany, it's not very effective anymore. In other words, they have you know, resistance erosion. Of course, they have a lot different um, diversity because they've had club root for there for a long time. So they have a lot more pathogen, you know, pathotypes there. But interesting, in some of these, like in the Northwest Germany, in 2005, they surveyed four fields and three were, were, didn't, wasn't controlled by the Mendel resistance. That's only four years after Mendel was introduced, right? So Germany, their example, so that the, the, the club root resistance 
was not very durable very long. And from my perspective, we probably got all of our club root resistance in canola from Mendel type resistance. So we shouldn't have been expecting something that was very durable. In Japan, they had some Chinese cabbage and, and they've had, they had a field there that was um, 15 years. It had been struggling with club root and they introduced a new club root resistant variety. The first year it worked pretty well, but they did notice a lot of small galls, it's very small galls. And then the second year after that, they planted that same variety back in and they had large galls. So in other words, the resistance had pretty good effect for one year and then the second year it was starting to de erode. So what about in Alberta? What is the evidence we've had in Alberta? Well, at the University of Alberta, they've got a, a published paper where they would take the galls from um, the St. Albert or Edmonton areas, they put it in a pot, grow the resistance out of a, a variety, collect the, you know, the galls, put it back in the soil, grow the same resistance. So keep trying, you know, keep planting the same resistance in the same pot. And they found that in as little as two crops, that resistance was starting to erode. Other reports, though, have not found the same. Shofang Wang with our department, she used a similar technique, but with tubs instead of small pots. And she had one experiment where she had three consecutive crops of, of a resistant variety, and the resistance didn't erode. I know Ralph Lang is here. He had done, he didn't publish it, I don't know why, but he had ones, kind of pot studies also, right? And he had, I think, as much as five in a row, and he never had resistance erosion. You know, so, it, you know, it, it can happen as little as two crops, but it's more probably like three or four where your resistance starts to become suspect. But we have fields around Everton now that have three, had three or four crops. So in, in other words, in short, we shouldn't have been surprised that we've detected um, resistance erosion now in Alberta fields. But that is a concern because we don't have any alternate um, sources of resistance. Initially, some of the work at the University of Alberta did show that planting these same varieties in the pots and resistance starts to fail, they planted something else and it seems to help the resistance. But it, it kind of indicated there were some differences but because with this res resistance new pathotype that we have, all the varieties are susceptible. That means the resistance sources couldn't have been that much different, really. So that's, that's something we're going to need, though, is different sources of resistance to come in to be able to manage this disease. That, the next step, and, and I think part of the, the issue was the growers had always faith that Oh, well, you guys will just be able to breed and do, and there are different sources of resistance in, you know, in the, in the brassica family, even in like the Polish canola family, the, the rapeseed, Polish rapeseed family, there is sources of resistance that we know. But it's not as easy to take resistance from Polish canola or turnips or, or kohlrabi and put it into Argentine canola quality. So, it'll be a period of five to 10 years to transfer that resistance into a decent variety versus taking from winter canola, that can be done in two or three, two or three years, right? So the, the next round I predict is gonna be a lot harder to get good resistance in a good agronomic variety and into a hybrid system. So that's, that's something I don't think maybe the producers appreciated it as much. If, when, you, when you're talking about a disease and overcoming the resistance, we really have two mechanisms to, de to delay that resistant erosion. You don't, you don't want to plant that resistance too frequently, so don't expose that resistance to the, the disease often, and to large populations. And in this case, club root has a lot of, lot of resting spores that it produces. It can produce a billion spores in a gram of soil. So you think of a smarty size, part of soil, there can be a billion grams in there, a billion spores in that, right? So if you're going to delay resistance, you either have to extend your rotation, to the, you know, the number of times or how often you're exposing it, as well as exposing it in, in, in cases where there's not as many spores. 
So the worst thing you can do then is canola every second year back to back on a club root field that's got really bad infestation. So you've got these really heavy patches with buildings of spores. You're going to very quickly select for resistance. So if you've got a, a field that's relatively clean, you don't have a lot of spores, your frequency of growing canola can go up, right? You can grow one in three, maybe there, or one in two if you haven't found any canola, but using a resistant variety, that's fine. You're not putting a lot of selection pressure there because there's no club root spores. Once you've got club root in the field, you really have to back off to a one in four rotation. Otherwise, you're gonna really pressure for that resistance to break down. And that's where some of the strategies from the producers, they said, well, I won't grow resistant varieties until I show I have a problem in the field. And so, well, that's when you'll select for resistance breakdown, doing it that way. If you would have planted a resistant variety and, and really slowed the establishment of the fields, you would have really extended the, probably the, the durability of that variety a lot longer than waiting until you have a problem and then pressure, you know, putting strong selection pressure on it. So some of the, some of the producers, I think, took, took a backward strategy. Anyways, you know, from our management plan, we had a one in four recommendation. So if you have a club root infested field, don't plant a resistant variety any more frequently than one in four years. That's still valid. We aren't going to be changing that. But it is, isn't a message that's been well adhered to, both from the producers as well as, um, you know, I know some of the retailers also were, were, if a farmer was asking for that variety and they knew they had club root, they should have been a little bit more adamant saying, you know, you're going to really force the breakdown by having this growing this one and two. So there, there's, a, there's a lot of responsibility in the industry, I think, to, to get that message over to a lot better. The, the, the value of the rotation is not to get rid of the club root in the field once it's there. If it, and you'll see in this pamphlet, I've got a persistence curve. And you can see that if you're growing canola once in three or once in four or once in five, you're not getting rid of the spores in that field. It's not going to go away from rotation, sorry. The rotation recommendation is only there to prolong that, that resistance until we come up with other sources of resistance. I wouldn't have been so worried if we knew we had other sources of resistance, but we don't, right? So that's why we were trying to make sure we have that, that one resistance so it's effective as long as possible. Once we get three or four different sources, I think we could probably manage it just by manage, um, alternating our resistance when we're growing in the field, but we're a long ways away from that. So now we have, we're back to square one on, on this one field because you can't grow any type of canola we know success, successfully, right? So he's back to probably not growing canola there more once or four, four or five years and then getting quite a yield loss still with that. And sanitation. He's going to want to be spreading, stopping that, that new strain from spreading to other fields. So now he's going to probably be washing his equipment from that field. We should be. He's probably going to be required to be. So all of a sudden, now all these things that are a lot less attractive for producers to do becomes a necessity, right? Versus if you would have maintained the durability of that resistance, it would have lasted a lot longer. So, you know, um, we do have effective resistance in almost all our fields, but we're at that point now, once, the, once there's been several crops of a resistant variety grown on that field, it's, it's probably starting to show some resistance erosion. We shouldn't be surprised about that. Any questions? In, in Southern Alberta, you, obviously your rotation's a lot more diverse, so you're lucky that way. You, you also have, other than last couple of years, drier <laughs> conditions, right? More, it is, moisture really promotes this disease. If you have, I don't, I don't, and we do know that soil pH has a small effect. The soil temperature during the canola early growth has a small effect. And that's why some people from Saskatchewan say, well, we have pH of soils at, you know, 7.5 we won't, or 8. We don't get, won't get club root. And that's not true. You will get club root. And if it's the moisture is there, you'll still get the disease. But it will be a less severity, but you still will get the disease. So the factors are in your favor here with you know, not, not growing canola that often, higher pH, drier soils, that you, the club root won't probably get to be such a severe problem that is in the Edmonton area. But it's not saying that it won't happen. In fact, and Rob has a question. I know you have in your vegetables is where you, you tend to have more of your, 
of, of the Columbia province, but um, it certainly is, wouldn't be ruled out. What would happen is it, if you get Columbia introduced to a field here, you would notice it on those years where the growing conditions were really good for canola, you know, good moisture, et cetera. Rob, I think you had a question. Yeah, just, a, just a comment on the other brassicas. Okay, so the host range, I talked about brassicas, which is the cabbage family. So, you know, obviously we think of our vegetables, you know, like turnips, cabbage, radishes, you know, um, all that, you know, Brussels sprouts, all that family. But you also got to think about the mustard family weeds. And so mustard is susceptible, right? And all the mustard family weeds. So stinkweed, shepherd's purse, et cetera. Which brings up another, another problem in southern Alberta that we don't maybe look at in other parts of the, uh, of the province is that we do know that it takes two or three weeks from infection to be able to produce galls that have resting spores. So we don't want weed growth more than two or three weeks. Okay, well that means you might have a, a stinkweed growing post-harvest in a club root infested field, get several weeks of growth and produce some new resting spores. So we might be considering things like more fall application of herbicide program to control volunteer canola, but also some of the, you know, the, the winter annuals in, in that in Nebraska family to prevent the club root spores from keep being produced. So there's other aspects that, you know, beyond just growing the resistant variety, et cetera, that you have to consider for, for this disease control. But certainly once you get it, in my opinion, you're going to farm with that clubbert disease the rest of your career, probably, for sure. Any other questions on the stewardship? And this, you know, this, this is a general pattern with disease resistance when it's usually single gene resistance, et cetera. You know, so we could think about stripe rust in wheat. It's going to be the same issue. You will get a resistant variety. We'll plant it too often and then just pressure for that resistance to to your road. So it's something that, you know, it's a general good agronomic practice when you get variety resistance and it's a narrow in scope, single gene. You can't use it too frequently when it's got these high populations. And this club root is a really good example of that. All right. Ralph, have any questions or any comments? I'll segue into what you're He'll segue into, oh, black leg resistance. <laughs> you know, so, uh, yes. And this is, this is something that we're going to actually need is to be able to, when different resources uh, resistance comes out, we're going to be able to have to classify them. Are they truly different? Don't tell me whether they're coming from Brassica wrapper or where they are, because that's not really telling me that they're different. We need a, a, a resistance grouping. So we need to know if it's club resistance group A or B or C, and I can rotate between A and B. That's what we're going to need for the producers, right, when, when the different resources come, resistance sources come. Yep. Mustard versus susceptible. Is it, is it all mustard? And I know we've been working on that new Brassica Carinata and they're hoping to expand acres in years to come on that. Is that one susceptible? And do you know if they're including resistance in their genetic makeup as well? Yeah, they're all susceptible, but they, 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 there's a different amount of possible resistance sources in them. You know, so Carinata, I'm, I'm not sure how much sources. When they did the screening for resistance in the, in the you know, major brassica families for oilseed, Juncea, Carinata, you know, and that, there, there was more in some of the species resistance sources than others. And I, I can't remember what Carinata, as far as I know, I don't think they're breeding for club resistance in the Carinata just because it's targeting more of the, you know, the drier areas. Eventually, I think we're going to, um, probably 10 years, that most of the, the canola that's growing on the prairies is probably going to have to have some club resistance because we've got it now in Saskatchewan, we've got it now in Manitoba and North Dakota, so it's, it's just going to continue to spread. Thanks. Question at the back. How much are you finding sort of in the southwest, uh, south of Highway 1, west of 36? Yes, we, we've had very few cases in the, in the south and southwest, um, and most of them have been in vegetable crops. Right, um, we did have years ago a, a, a suspicious finding in the county of Lethbridge, and what it was was hybridization nodules. But they, they tested positive in a lab test. It, unfortunately, it can be a false positive in in the lab test. So that's why you really need to be sure. 
and we we continued that investigation we were able to rule out that yeah that was that was hybridization nodules and it wasn't club root but it's not saying that it's not going to show up here but so so for, so far we haven't really had any confirmed canola in the southwest there is some a few plants in the, in the special areas that were found on a summer fallow field um, but really wasn't found in a canola crop etc so you're, you're quite fortunate that way but again you've got a lot of factors in your favor You know, um, the, the question was how long before it's probably, you know, club resistance is in most of the varieties that are marketed. I'd say once Saskatchewan and Manitoba have, you know, um, more than 500 fields of club root in, in their provinces, um, and then the pressure's on for them to grow club root resistance. Once that happens, I think they'll be become, it'll become general in all varieties. You know, but that's, that's probably you know five ten years down the road before they get into that club root situation. We've been since two thousand and three, and we're at this situation where it's pretty endemic in the Edmonton area, and we're starting to get resistance erosion. So they're at least five seven years behind us. Okay. Well. Like I said, most of what I've talked to is in there, and just remember that the stewardship of, of resistance is something that it's, it's not just a farmer responsibility, but it's also you know, retailers that when you know, guy, you know a guy has a problem with a disease and he wants a certain variety, it's, it's your best interest to try to coax him into maybe growing a different crop or a different variety with different resistance. Okay, and with that, I'll, I'll end here, and I think Ralph is up next.